All right, let me share my screen. Let's work through some problems. Go on here to the to the book. Let's pull up the uh, exercises. Excuse me. <clears throat> so we got. Let me pull up the uh, list of. All right. So here's what I want to get through. Don't know if I'll get through all of them. But let's start with the first one here. Exercise 11, 1A. Hopefully my pen doesn't run out of battery. So I was using it a lot last night um, to make the answer key for the practice exam. And it was, it was it had run out of battery and so I put it back in its docking station. But then I turned the computer off right away after that. And the only way for the pen to charge, the battery to charge, is if it's in the docking station with my computer on. So it might run out of batteries pretty quickly. If that happens, yikes, I don't know what I'll do. I have to improvise somehow. Maybe I can use the mouse as a pen. So we got exercise 11, 1A. And um, so this is in regards to dividends. Cash dividends, it looks like. So Lake Company has the following shares outstanding. Let me make this bigger on the screen. So we're down here. Lake Company has the uh, following shares outstanding. 20,000 shares um, of, it looks like preferred stock. The preferred stock has $50 par value per share, and it's 5% cumulative preferred stock. 5% cumulative, that has to do with dividends. So if Lake Company declares a dividend, the preferred shareholders are going to get 5% um, of the per share dividend will be 5% of $50. And, um, or five or, or uh, $2.5, it looks like per share and and this word cumulative here me, refers to the fact that if Lake Company hadn't has not given a dividend in the previous year or years that, and they decide to give a dividend this year then the preferred shareholders will get the dividend this year for those previous years that they should have gotten then they'll get the dividend for this year and then any money left over would go to the common shareholders for this year so dividends and arrears Dividends and arrears are, um, are dividends that the firm did not pay in a previous year. Um, and then what else? They have 80,000 shares of common stock outstanding. Each of these common shares is, uh, the par value is $10. The company declared a cash dividend amounting to $200,000. That's what they're paying as a total cash dividend. So part A, if no dividends and arrears on the preferred stock exist. So there, there weren't any prior years where they didn't pay a dividend. How much in total dividends and in dividends per share is paid to each class of stock? So how much is paid to the preferred shareholders? How much is paid to the common shareholders? $200,000 is paid total to all of them. So how much of that goes to preferred versus common? So the preferred are gonna get it, they're gonna get their cut of the 200,000 first. They are preferred over the common shareholders in terms of this, in terms of dividends. That's what preferred stock means. So um, we need to calculate the preferred shareholders dividend first. Um, let's see, the preferred stock is 5%, there's 20,000 shares outstanding. So 
that means we take shares outstanding. Now let's do this the other way. We need to get the dividend per share. So we take the 5%, we multiply it by the par value. So this is the dollars of dividends the preferred shareholders are going to get for each share of stock that's out there. And then there's 20,000 shares out there. So the preferred shareholders are going to get, well, I could do this in my head, $50,000. in total or two and a half dollars per share, right? This is the per share. And then the common shareholders are gonna get whatever's left. So they're gonna get $200,000 is the total cash dividend paid minus the 50,000 that's given to the uh, preferred shareholders. So the common shareholders are going to get $150,000 in dividends. Or um, if you want to figure out how much do the common shareholders get per share outstanding, we need to divide that by the number of common shares outstanding. There's 80,000 common shares outstanding. So 150 over 80 is um, 1.875 per share. So there we go. That's the answer to part A. Preferred gets this, common gets this. Per share amounts would be these and these. Part B. <clears throat> if one year of dividends and arrears exist on the preferred stock, how much total dividends and per share dividends are paid to each class? Since the preferred stock is cumulative preferred stock, that means the preferred shareholders are entitled to dividends and arrears. So they would get They would get the um, the dividend that they should have gotten last year. Assuming last year the same number of shares are outstanding at the end of last year as are outstanding at the end of this year, which they haven't told us any information to lead us to figure out that that wouldn't be the case. So they get that for last year, you know, plus they get the same thing for this year. So they're paid this year, but they're going to get this amount uh, reflecting that they what they should have gotten last year, plus they're going to get that same amount for this year. So they're going to get two times this essentially. I'm writing it out more so you can hopefully follow. So instead of getting $50,000, you're going to get $100,000. Or on a per share basis, um, total amount they're getting this year is 100,000. Total shares outstanding at the end of this year is 20,000. They're getting a $5 dividend per share, essentially. So 
So there's how much goes to the preferred in total or this much per share, outstanding. And then the common gets, so the common now gets the total div cash dividend the company's paying minus the stuff that goes to the preferred. So instead of getting 150, they only get 100. Or on a per share basis, you have to divide it by the number of common shares outstanding. Um, the common shareholders are only getting um, $1.25 per share. So there's, there are the answers to um, part B. Uh, this is how much goes to preferred in total or this much per share. This is how much goes to common in total or this much per share. So dividends and arrears. Um, that kind of hurts the common shareholders, right? Because preferred shareholders are going to get their dividend for previous years, then their dividend for this year, and then whatever's left goes to us for a common shareholder. Any questions on uh, exercise 11-1A? Let's see. All right. Let's do the next one. Let's do two way. <clears throat> Minaret issued 10,000 shares, a $50 par value preferred stock for $68 a share. And they issued 12,000 shares of no par value common stock at $15 per share. Common stock has also no stated value. Don't worry about what stated value is. Sometimes um, in some states, um, companies, the, the policy is a company can have a no par value on their stock, but if it has no par value, then they have to give it a stated value, which is just like the par value, essentially. It's not the market value. Don't worry about that about knowing what stated value is. All issuances were for cash. Part A, prepare the journal entries to record the share issuances. So we'll do a journal entry for each class of stock. We could combine all of it into one journal entry, but let's just do a journal entry for each class. So for the preferred shareholders, you're going to um, debit, Minaret is going to debit cash for 10,000 shares times $68 a share. That's what they got. Cash goes up by 680,000. So this is, I'm gonna put, I'll put little a right here. So little a calculated as 10,000 shares times the market value per share. Debit cash, we're going to credit preferred stock at par So credit preferred stock for $500,000. I'll put little b right here. Little b is calculated as the 10,000 shares, shares issued times the par value per share. Then the additional paid in capital, I, I just call it APIC preferred. It stands for additional paid in capital or Paid in capital in excess of par is another is what the book uses. Or the book says paid in capital. Capital paid in by shareholders in excess, above and beyond 
par value. Here's the capital paid in by shareholders for par value. And the rest of it to make up the 680 is the additional paid in capital. So 180,000 is just the, the plug. There's the journal entry for the preferred shareholders for issuing the preferred stock. For issuing the common stock, the firm receives 12,000 times $15 per share. So we're going to debit cash for 12,000 shares times $15 a share or $180,000. So I'll put a little C right there, a little C. Number of shares issued times the price they got for each share. And then um, credit common stock for at par, credits common stock at par, which is 12,000. Um, there is no par. So in this case, when there's no par, you just credit common stock at, at, the, at the market value. So there is no additional paid in capital in excess of par, because there is no par. So that's the journal entry for issuance to the common shareholders. Part B. Prepare the journal entry for the issuance of the common stock, assuming that it had a stated value of $4 per share. Stated value and par value are synonyms. Technically, they're not synonyms, but don't worry about the technical distinction. For all intents and purposes, just assume that if a problem says stated value, that means that they're saying par value. And you know what to do with par value. So prepare the journal entry for the issuance of common stock like you did in part A, but instead assume that the common stock has a par value of $4 a share. Well, then the journal entry is going to be just like this, but with a slight modification. Now we're going to have some additional paid in capital in excess of par because we have par, because now we have a par value, $4 a share. So debit cash for 180. Credit common stock at par. I'll put little d. Little d is calculated as there's 12,000 shares we issued. Each share, it said, had a $4 par value. And so that's where the 48,000 comes from. And then the difference would be credited to additional paid in capital common stock. Um, the difference would be, well, 180 minus 50 would be 130. So 180 minus 48, 132. All right. Moving right along. Part C. Prepare the journal entry for the issuance of the common stock assuming that it had a par value of $2 a share. Here they use the word the words par value instead of stated value, it's the same thing. Well, that's just, a, just like this journal entry. It's gonna look just like this in form. The numbers will be slightly different. So let's copy this, paste, and then just change, change the numbers. We always credit common stock at par if there is a par value. In this case, we would credit common stock for $24,000. Um, where does that come from? Let's put a little E right here by that calculation. So a little E, so 12,000 shares of common stock outstanding times the par value, which they said in the part C, the par value is gonna be $2 a share. So that's what 24,000 comes from. And then the difference would go to additional paid in capital or um, 156, I believe. So there's the journal entry in part C. Any questions on exercise 11.2? Nothing at all? Pretty straightforward.
let's go and do three. Looks like we're going to do three, four, five, six. Just moving right along. Here we're doing a problem which tests the concept of your, no your knowledge of stock splits. On March 1st of the current year, Center Corporation has 500,000 shares of $10 par value common stock that are issued and outstanding. The general ledger shows the following account balances relative to the common stock. So there's 5 million in the common stock account, right? 500,000 shares outstanding times the $10 par value per share. And then there's $3.5 million in the additional paid in capital common stock account. So that gives us information where we can solve for the market value, right? Something times 500,000 uh, or something minus 10 times 500,000 equals 3.5 million. So 3.5 million is the difference between the market value and the par value multiplied by the number of shares. So we can figure out the market value. Anyway, on March 2nd, Center Corporation splits its stock two for one. So this is a forward stock split. And it reduces the par value to $5 per share. How many shares of common stock are issued and outstanding immediately following the stock split? So if 500 shares, 500,000 shares were um, issued and outstanding before the split, then a two for one forward split um, would double the shares outstanding. So the answer is just take the shares outstanding, issued and outstanding, multiply by two. So there's now 1 million shares issued and outstanding. For each share that was already out there, it now counts as two shares. It's like we took that share and we split it in half. Now we have two for each one. So a million. Part B. Um, what is the balance in the common stock account immediately following the stock split? Well, we take our million shares issued and outstanding. At each share now, the par value, instead of being $10 per share before the stock split, since we did a two for one, that means the par value cut in half per share. And so the balance in common stock after the stock split is still 5 million. It hasn't changed. Stock splits don't change total owner's equity. See, still 5 million. It's what it was before. And the balance in common stock is still 5 million. The only thing that changes with the stock split is the number of shares outstanding and the par value per share. C, what is the balance in additional paid in capital common stock immediately following the stock split? Um, the same as it was before, that doesn't change. D. Is a journal entry required to record the forward stock split? If yes, prepare the entry. No. Because the stock split does not change any account balances, no journal, no journal entry is required to record it. You might want to record a memo, like a little statement, um, like a little note in the journal. 
saying that you did a stock split to, to let people know that the par value changed per share. So no journal entry required since no account balances changed. Additional paid in capital doesn't change. Any questions on exercise 11.3a? All right. Keep moving along. Let's look at the 4a. All right. Treasury stock. Inland Corporation issued 30,000 shares of $5 par value common stock at $15 a share and 8,000 shares of $50 par value 8% preferred stock at $85 a share. Later, the company purchased 3,000 shares of its own common stock at $20 a share. Prepare the journal entries to record the share issuances and the purchase of the common shares. All right, so part A, let's make the journal entry for the common share issuance. So we're going to debit cash for Inland receives um, $15 a share times the 30 shares, 30,000 shares. So they're going to get $450,000. In exchange, the common shareholders, uh, the owner's equity goes up, common stock goes up by the par value, 30,000 times $5 a share. And the, the rest is additional paid in capital common, or 300,000. So that's the journal injury for the issuance of the common stock. For the issuance of the preferred stock, we'll do the journal entry for that separately. So with the preferred stock, they receive, they issue 8,000 shares. For each share, they get $85. So they get $680,000. So 8,000 shares times $85 a share. Preferred shareholders' equity goes up goes up by par value, so 8,000 shares times the $50 per share par value to 400,000. And the rest goes to additional paid in capital. So 280,000 it looks like. All right, and then finally the treasury stock journal entry. What did they do? Last sentence. Later, the company purchased 3,000 of its shares of common stock for $20 a share. So that reduces owner's equity. You're buying back equity from your owners. So we debit an account called treasury stock. This is a contra owner's equity account. It's not a temporary account. It's a permanent account, but it's a contra owner's equity account. It has a normal debit balance. We debit treasury stock. Um, for what we paid for the stock, 3000 times $20 a share. So we must have paid $60,000. And to get that stock back, we had to get rid of an asset, cash. So credit cash, $60,000. So there we go. Those are the three journal entries. Uh, this is the journal entry for issuing the common stock. This is the journal issue entry for issuing the preferred stock and this is a journal entry for for buying the for buying back our stock treasury stock all right let's um do part b assume that inland sold 2000 shares of the treasury stock 
at $30 a share. What's the journal entry to record the sale of the treasury stock? So after this journal entry right here, we have 3,000 shares of treasury stock. Suppose we sell 2,000 of those shares, we reissue 2,000 of those shares back to, you know, we sell them back to people who want to own stock in our company. We'll debit cash. What are we receiving? We're receiving the 2,000 share times $30 a share. We're receiving $60,000. And treasury stock is going down now, right? Because we're reselling it, reissuing it back. So we got to reduce treasury stock. Um, 2,000 shares are leaving. Um, but we can't reduce treasury stock for more than what we originally paid for it. So we reduce treasury stock 2,000 shares times $20 a share because that's what we originally paid for it. So I'll put a little A right here. A little A is calculated as 2,000 shares times what we originally paid for it. And then the, the, the rest of it, is additional paid in capital, treasury stock. Uh, maybe I should make, separate these numbers a little bit here. Move this over here a little bit more. So treasury stock is a contra owner's equity account. Additional paid in capital treasury stock is an owner's equity account. It has a normal credit balance. It increases, when we credit it, it increases owner's equity. So this APIC dash treasury stock account only comes about when we reissue treasury stock that we previously purchased from our shareholders. And it behaves just like additional paid in capital common stock or additional paid in capital preferred stock. It has a normal credit balance. Treasury stock is the account that has the, con it's a the contra owner's equity account has a normal debit balance, reduces owner's equity. Finally, C, assume that Inland sold the remaining 1,000 shares of treasury stock at $18 a share. So we sold it back to the shareholders for less than what we paid for it. So we haven't done, haven't talked about uh, how to do that. So what are we receiving again? Cash. We're getting 1,000 shares times $18 a share. Um, oops, I mean to do that. Now we're going to get rid of treasury stock. Treasury stock is going down by whatever we paid for it originally, 1,000 shares times $20 a share. And the difference goes to AP. I see treasury stock, $2,000. Let's line these numbers up here. This is how you do that whenever you reissue stock for a price lower than what you bought it for. It, we debit additional paid in capital treasury stock. So we reduce owner's equity by debiting this account. We increase owner's equity by crediting this account. So, I mean, if you had a question on the exam, what does this journal entry do to the accounting equation? Assets go up by 18,000 because cash is debited. Liability is not affected. Owner's equity goes down by 2,000 right here. But then it goes up by 20,000 because we've credited a contra owner's equity account. And so the net effect of this is that owner's equity goes up by 18,000. So the accounting equation stays in balance. I haven't really gone over effect on the accounting equation lately. But just to keep that in mind, uh, that's what would happen. All right.
Any questions on exercise 11 for a All right, let's move on to 5A. Oh, let's see. All right, Bernard Corporation has the following shares outstanding. 8,000 shares of $50 par value, 6% preferred stock, and 50,000 shares of $1 par value common stock. The company has $328,000 of retained earnings before, before um, declaring these uh, dividends. At year end, the company declares its regular $3 per share cash dividend on the preferred stock and a $2.20 per share cash dividend on the common stock. Three weeks later, they pay the dividend that they declared. As I talked about last time, there are three dates in regards to dividends. The date of declaration, the date of record, and the date of payment. You have to make a journal entry on the date of declaration and the date of payment. So part A, prepare the journal entry for the declaration of the cash dividends. So here, we, did a, we already did a problem relating to cash dividends, but the information given to you was given in a different form. They gave you the total dollars and dividends they're going to pay. That was exercise 111A. They were going to pay $200,000 total dividends. And, uh, and the question was how much goes to preferred, how much goes to common. Here they give you the information differently. They tell you what they're going to pay to each share, to each class of shareholders per share. They just tell you. They give you the per share number, like this much for common and then $3 for preferred. It's just It's a similar problem, but just information is given to you in a different way. When we declare cash dividends, Oh, in the previous question that we did about dividends, we didn't have to make the journal entry. We were just calculating the dollar amounts that go to each class. But here they want us to make the journal entry. So when we declare these cash dividends, um, we need to make a journal entry for the preferred and for the common. But we can just put this in one journal entry. So we're going to debit. We could debit retained earnings because dividends reduce retained earnings as soon as you declare them, essentially, or well, they should. They don't have to though. Um, we could, most companies, instead of debiting retained earnings right away, they debit an account called cash dividends. It's a temporary account, has a normal debit balance. Remember, remember our acronym at the beginning of the course, dealer? We said D stands for dividends, well here it is. Dividends, expenses, assets have normal debit balances, and then liabilities, owners, equity, and revenue accounts have normal credit balances. So that dividends finally comes into play. Um, this is a temporary account. We're going to close this account out to retained earnings at the end of the year. So we're going to debit cash dividends for the amount that we're saying we're going to pay. What's the total amount of cash dividends we're going to pay? We're going to pay $3 per share to the preferred shareholders. And there's 8,000 shares outstanding. So here they just give you the dividend. You don't have to calculate it 6% of $50. You don't have, they, they give you. So, um, well, 6% of $50 is $3 per share. <laughs> but they tell that to you. 0 0.06 times 53. So $3 per share times 8,000 shares to the preferred shareholders. Uh, so let's, we'll put a little A right here, and little A is calculated as $3 per share times 8,000 shares. So this is the preferred plus also common shareholders, we're going to give $2.20 a share times um, 50,000 shares of common stock outstanding. And so all that sums up to 
$134,000. This is the dividends we're going to pay. Now we're gonna credit, once we declare the dividend, it becomes a liability to us. So we're gonna have to credit preferred dividends payable for the amount that we owe to the preferred shareholders, which is this, $24,000. And we have to credit common dividends payable, whoops, for the amount that we owe to the common shareholders. I'm writing fast, so my writing is messy, but I'm also talking so you can, it makes it easier to figure out what I'm writing. So the 2.2 times the 50,000, this is what we owe to the common shareholders, 110,000. So there's the journal entry for part A. Part B. Prepare the journal entry for the payment of the cash dividends. Well, when we pay the cash dividends, we we can get rid of these two liabilities because we just paid them. So we need to debit those and credit cash. So we'll just copy. These now are become debited. And we credit cash with 134,000. This journal entry required on the date of declaration, this journal entry required on the date of payment. Uh, it doesn't ask it doesn't ask us um, but in, we could if we also suppose there was a part C, there's not a part C but suppose there was and it said to close out the dividend account at the end of the year. So this account still has 134,000 in it. We would close it out to retained earnings. So we would debit retained earnings. 134,000 credit cash dividends. 134,000. Now cash dividends has a balance of zero. It's a temporary account. All temporary accounts should have a balance of zero at the end of the period after you close them out. Cash dividends is just like all the expense accounts and all the revenue accounts. Their balances are all closed to zero and they're all closed out to retained earnings. So this journal entry by debiting retained earnings. Retained earnings has a normal credit balance. It's owner's equity account. So when we debit retained earnings, we reduce owner's equity. And then of course, when we credit cash dividends, um, It's like we artificially increase uh, owner's equity. So that, that's the effect on the accounting equation. Owner's equity, nothing's changed. Owner's equity remains the same. No, that's not true. Uh, cash dividends, what is this? Owner's equity does not remain the same. It goes down by 134. As a result of this journal entry. Um, this is just a temporary account though. So when we credit that account, what does that do to the accounting equation? Let's think. I guess you could think of it like as a quasi asset. So assets go down by 134. Anyway. Um, anyway, let's move on to the next question and if there aren't any questions on 5a any questions on 5a 6a then this is uh just like 5a only now we're doing stock dividends white corporation has 80,000 shares of common stock outstanding five dollar par value per share at the end of the year they declare a five percent stock dividend the market price of the stock on the declaration date $20 a share. Four weeks later, they issue the shares to the current shareholders. 
prepare the journal entry for the declaration of the stock dividend. All right, with stock dividends, you have to decide whether it's a large stock dividend or a small stock dividend. So that's the first thing you always have to do with stock dividends. Is it a large stock dividend or a small stock dividend? So this is a small stock dividend. because the stock dividend, 5%, is less than 25%. So if the number of shares that they're giving as a dividend is less than 25% of the total shares outstanding at the time they're going to get the dividend, then it's a small stock dividend. If the number of shares they're giving as a dividend is greater than or equal to 25% of the total shares outstanding, then it's a large stock dividend. Small stock dividends recorded at market value. Large stock dividends recorded at par value. So the journal entry is different depending on whether it's small or large. So the journal entry in uh, part A, we would um, debit stock dividends for market market value. So uh, I'm going to put a little uh, little A over here. A will be calculated as the number of shares outstanding. We're giving a 5% dividend. So this is the this is the number of shares we're giving as a dividend. And we're going to record this dividend at market value. So each share said the market value and the date of declaration is $20 a share. So 80 times 0 0.05 is four. So we're getting a 4,000 share dividend. Each share is market value is $20. So the market value of this stock is $80,000. We debit stock dividends for 80,000. Stock dividends is just like cash dividends up here. It's a temporary account. We close it out to retained earnings at the end of the accounting period. Debit stock dividends, uh, we're gonna credit an account. It's like a, it's a quasi liability, it's not really a liability, it's just a holding account, a temporary account to reflect the fact that we owe these dividends, these, um, no, actually no, it's not a quasi liability. It is a liability, it's just like dividends payable. When we credited dividends payable up here, it's like that, only we just call it not payable but distributable because you don't pay shares of stock, you distribute them. Div stock dividends distributable. I'm running out of room here. Let's move this up here. Credit stock dividends distributable at par. So a 4,000 share dividend we're giving times par value. Par value was five per share, so $20,000. And, um, and the rest we credit to, oops, sorry. The rest we credit to additional paid in capital. common because these are all common shares we're distributing. So that's what we do on the date of declaration. Then on the date of payment,
So prepare the journal entry for the declaration, done. Prepare the journal entry for the issuance. So the date of issuance or the date of payment. The date of issuance, we um, get rid of our liability stock, dividends, distributable. Actually, sorry, to be technical here, the stock dividends distributable is not a liability like cash dividends payable is. What would happen if we prepared a balance sheet in between this date and this date? So in between the date of declaration and the date of payment, the date of issuance, the stock dividends. What if the balance sheet fell like right in the middle here? This account on the balance sheet would just be a reduction of owner's equity. So we'd have our owner's equity, our common stock, would be listed right underneath common stock. Our common stock um, would be 80,000 shares as of this date. 80,000 shares are still out there in the shareholder's hands, not 84,000. We haven't given the 4,000 dividend yet. So 80,000 shares are in the shareholder's hand, hands. Oh, I think I said this would be a reduction. It'd be not a reduction, an addition. So common stock would be 80,000 times the $5 par value, so $400,000. And right underneath that would be stock dividends distributable, $20,000. And the sum of those two would be the common shareholder's equity, the total. Because as of this date, if the date, if the balance sheet date fell in between here, um, we're going to give these 4,000 shares out in the future. And the par value of those shares would be 20,000. So that'll be added to common stock in the future. And then when we do give them out on the date of issuance, we make the journal entry debit stock dividends distributable credit common stock so it's going into common stock eventually when we issue it hopefully that makes sense so this is not like really a liability because um, these are shares that we're going to issue up here this is cash we're obligated to pay so that's a liability to satisfy that li liability we have to give up this asset right when we set this is where we satisfy the liability for the cash dividends. Here we don't. This isn't really a liability. We, we're going to give these uh, stock dividends, and to satisfy that, we give them, and that increases owner's equity. So stock dividends distributable is not a liability, like you know, stock dividends pay or um, cash dividends payable. All right, part C. Assume that the company declared a 30% stock dividend rather than a 5% stock dividend. So just repeat part A and B, but instead of a 5% stock dividend, it was a 30% stock dividend. All right, now instead of having a small stock dividend, we have a large stock dividend. Um, since 30% is greater than 25%. So large stock dividends are recorded at par value. So what we would do, our journal entry would look like part A, but we wouldn't have um, additional paid in capital. So we just have one debit and one credit. We would debit stock dividends, not for market value, but for par value. So for the, we would debit stock dividends for the 4,000 shares we're giving as a dividend. No, not, no, we're not giving 4,000 shares as a dividend because our percentage has changed. Now it's 30%. Of 80,000, but then we want to multiply not by market value per share, but par value. So 80,000 shares outstanding times a 30% dividend is 24,000 share dividend. Each share's par value is $5. So that's $120,000 for debiting stock dividends for par value. I'll put a little A calculation here. I'll put a little B. It's the um, 80,000 shares outstanding times percent dividend. This is how many shares we're going to give as a dividend times the dollar per share par value, not market value, because it's a large stock dividend, because 30% is greater than 25%, greater than or equal to 25%. Debit stock dividends, 120,000. Credit stock dividends distributable. For the same amount. 
There's no APIC. And then that's the date of declaration. And then the date of issuance, we just get rid of our stock dividends distributable. And credit common stock. Now the shares are out there in the shareholders' hands. So common stock increases by $120,000. Any questions on exercise 11, 6A? All right. 9A, I guess we'll just go till my, either the time runs out or my pen runs out in battery, one or the other, whichever comes first. Reverse stock split. Upland Metals Company has 20 million shares of $0.01 par value per share, common stock outstanding, which had been sold for an aggregate amount of $300 million. The company's shares are traded on the NYSE, and the NYSE has a minimum listing price of a dollar per share. If you know, if you're a stock on the NYSE and the, the market value of your stock, your share price falls below a dollar and remains below a dollar for, um, usually I think it's 90 days, here they have 30 days, then you get delisted. Recently, the company's common stock has been trading on the exchange below a dollar per share. And the exchange has notified the company that its common stock would be delisted in 30 days if the stock price did not rebound above a dollar minimum listing price. In response to this notification, Upland Metals sort of mechanically made, makes this happen, just artificially makes this happen by authorizing a one for 40 reverse stock split. Following the reverse stock split, how many common shares will be outstanding? Uh, interesting side note, um, if you buy and sell stocks in the stock market, I don't know if any of you do, but um, some of you may, and all of you probably will at some point in the future, or the large majority of you will. Um, something to watch out for, something to not get your hopes up about. Uh, I, I own, in the past, this has happened a few times, but I figured out what was going on. I've owned some small stocks, and their price had dropped below minimum listing price. I didn't even realize it. I was just looking at the value of my account every day. And one day I saw the value of my account just shoot up by a factor of like 2,000%. Like my account had a $2,000 value and all of a sudden had a $12,000 value or some crazy thing like that. And I was like, what is going on? Like, how did the prices go up that much? And so I was looking through my portfolio of stocks and I noticed that there was this one stock that was causing the whole portfolio to shoot up this much. One stock had gone up by like 14,000% or something in one day. And I called the I called my broker and I was like, what's going on? And they said, that company did a reverse stock split. And what happens when you do the reverse stock split, each share that you have of that stock now is worth, you know, in this case, 40 times more than it was before each share. And you multiply that new price by the number of shares you have, and that's the extra dollars you have. Um, however, the what also happens is each share you have is now is now only one fortieth of a share if it's a one for forty. So it, it shouldn't really change the overall because you're taking, you know, each share is one fortieth of it what of what it was before. But now this one fortieth of a share is worth forty times more than it was before. So you're 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 left no better or worse off, right? But in the in the market, um, what happens is one of those things happens before the other thing happens. So each share is worth 40 times more than it was before, but you don't have one fourth, you still have the whole share. And then it reflects in your accounts that you actually have one fortieth of a share like three days later. And so that's what made my account look like it was doing so much better than it really was. So watch out for that. Don't get your hopes up. If it's too good to be true, something something's wrong. All right, anyway, following the reverse stock split, how many common shares will be outstanding? 
well, there were 20 million shares before the stock split. And then we do for a one for 40, that means each share is, is now um, I'm sorry, each, if we do a one for 40 stock split, each share is now that you have is now worth is now one fortieth of a share. So we got to do the dividing. So with a forward stock split, we multiply with a reverse stock split, we divide. 20 million divided by 40, 5 million. No, 500,000. 20 million divided by four would be 5 million. We divide by 40 is 500,000 shares outstanding after the stock split. But each share that's outstanding is worth 40 times more than it was before. So B, uh, what will be the new par value per share? Well, it'll just be old par value times 40. So old power value is one cent a share. So whatever this is, 40 cents now, right? And then part C, the par value doesn't really affect you as a shareholder, but the market value is what you care about. Has the, has the market value increased by 40? Uh, yes, it does. It increases pretty quickly, actually, especially for companies that are traded on the NYSE. Uh, the, mark, the, the price goes up right away, pretty much. How will the reverse stock split be recorded in the company's accounts? Again, it's just like the forward stock split. Um, no, no accounts. It's just like up here where we did the forward stock split. No journal entry required since no account balances change. You might want to put a memo in your in your in your journal to let people to you know to remind yourself and let others know that who see the journal that um, that you did a reverse stock split. All right, any questions on all exercise 11, 9A? This, is, this, this question highlights one of the major reasons companies do reverse stock splits. You don't see it very often, but often when they do it, it's because they wanna get their, their market price um, above the minimum listing price so that they don't get delisted. 10A. So this is getting at sort of the, some of the last concepts we talked about in the PowerPoint presentation when we lectured over the chapter yesterday. These ratios, return on common stockholders equity, dividend yield, and dividend payout. Following information relates to Ontario components. So they, for 2018, 2019, they give us net income, the dollars and dividends declared and paid to the preferred shareholders, the average common stockholders equity as of the end of each of these years. This isn't the balance in common shareholders equity at the end of the year, it's the average common shareholders equity at the end of each year. So in 2018, this 2 million must be the balance in shareholders equity at the end of the year, plus the balance in shareholders equity at the beginning of the year, divided by two equals 2 million. Same thing for 2019. Um, the dividend per common share is 1.5 in 2018, 1.5 in 2019. Earnings per share, both years, and the market price per share as of as of, at the end of the year. Looks like the share price went up. Calculate the company's return on common stockholders equity for 2018 and 2019. If you recall, We 
return on equity. It's equal to well, any return formula or rate of return formula is we're going to have return in the numerator and the original investment in the denominator. And so what's the return for common shareholders? It's the company's net income. But not all of that, the common shareholders could potentially get dividends from. Um, we also subtract, we have to subtract from that the stuff out of this that they give to the preferred shareholders because the common shareholders won't get that. So in 2018, we need to subtract the 5,000. So minus, I'll just do the formula in general first. Minus dividends to preferred. So the numerator is the return, the dollar return to common shareholders. And then we divide, we divide that by the average common shareholders equity. And this is the investment that the common shareholders uh, made. So ROE in 2018, <coughs> excuse me, will be 65,000 minus the 5,000 given to the preferred divided by the 2 million. Or 3%. And in 2019, let's see if ROE went up or did it go down? It'd be the 100,000 uh, minus the 5,000 divided by the 2.1 million. Looks like it might have gone up. and you get 4.5%. Part B, calculate the company's dividend yield for 2018 and 2019. Again, from the PowerPoints, dividend yield equals It's the um, dividend the company gives per share divided by so the cash dividend per share given divided by whatever the, mar the, the dollar value per share market price is. Uh, as of the end of the year. So the dividend yield in 2018 on common stock is, common shareholders were given $1.50 per share and the market price at the end of the year for each share of common stock is worth $27.50. So the dividend yield is, uh, whoops, get away. Trying to get these boxes out of the way. There we go. So the dividend yield is uh, it's expressed in percentages as a percent, essentially, or as a ratio of two dollars. So the dollar signs cancel. So 1.5 divided by 27.5 uh, is five and a half percent dividend yield. 0.055. The idea is, say you're someone wanting to buy this company's common stock. How much do you have to pay per share? This, at the year end. How much is the company going to give you guaranteed as a dividend? A dollar and fifty cents. So you got to pay this 
to get a dollar and fifty cents. So your yield is five point five percent. You're going to get five point five point five percent back of what you gave them. But you also potentially the value of your stock could go up from twenty seven fifty. It looks like up to thirty, and then you could sell your stock at the end of twenty nineteen and make the difference. You can also so there's two way two reasons two ways to make money on buying stocks. You know this already. Share price appreciation. Right, your stock, your value of your shares goes up, you sell them, you make money, or the company gives you a dividend, or both. Dividend yield to common shareholders in 2019 would just be the 1.5 divided by 30. So dividend yield actually goes down. <coughs> And it goes down to 5%. And then finally, C. Calculate the company's dividend payout for 2018 and 2019. What's dividend payout? What's the formula in general? It has the same numerator as dividend yield. But the denominator is earnings per share. Which is calculated essentially as the dollars of net income divided by the number of shares outstanding. But they already gave us what the earnings per share was. Dividend payout in 2018 for the common shareholders would be the dollar and fifty cents dividend per share divided by the two dollars and ninety cent earnings per share. So the idea here is every share that the shareholders own. The company in 2018 earned $2.90 for that share. That was the net income that the company earned. How much of that net income did the company pay back to the shareholders? So of the $2.9 earned on every share they paid back in the form of a dividend, $1.50. So dividend payout. It's the fraction of earnings that's paid out as dividends per, on, a per, on a per share basis. So 1.5 divided by 2.9. Is that 0 0.517? So 51.7% dividend payout ratio. And in that's a good dividend payout ratio. And in 2019, our uh, dividend per share was the same. But our earnings per share is uh, $3. So our dividend payout ratio will drop slightly to 50%, 1.5 divided by three. Any questions on exercise uh, 11, 10, A? All righty, do we have time for, let's look at 13, A. Is it something new that we haven't done yet? Yeah, it's stuff that we've already, it, it, it might be a harder problem from what we've already done, but essentially we've covered um, every concept in chapter 11, at least at the, at the intermediate level. Some of these other problems might be a little bit harder, but um, since we've gone through the most of the concepts and it's 1 p.m., I feel like that's a good place to stop the video. Does anybody have any questions at all? The solutions to um, all of those those ones that I listed on the Word document, even though we didn't do them today on the video, the solutions to those are on Blackboard. If there are no questions, then um, have a great weekend, and I will see you guys on Tuesday. And of course, I'll send you the links on Monday for the uh, lecture and the office hours. Have a good weekend.